Hi, Judd. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Let me uh, introduce you. Uh, and me. Actually, I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV, and this is The Wright Show. You are Judson Brewer, um, and there's a couple ways I could introduce you. Uh, you teach at uh, Yale Medical School and have done uh, important research, brain scan research, about uh, you know what the brain seems to be doing uh, during meditative states. Um, and you are also a very serious uh, and accomplished meditator yourself, I would say. Um, but I got to say, the, the thing that, the biographical detail that I find most arresting about you is something you told me, which is that when you go to the dentist and are getting your teeth drilled, you choose not to use Novocaine or any other anesthetic. Is that true? Right, but I don't know if that would separate me from any masochist. <laughs> uh, no, it wouldn't separate you from them, but, 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 but yeah, that you're not doing it for masochistic reasons, right? I mean, you, uh, this is, it's because of your experience with meditation that you're able to do that, is that right? I guess so, yes. Uh-huh. And, and I've, I've got to say that, you know, the Novocaine is kind of gross. There's this kind of, you know, your face is numb for hours. So I can kind of see the appeal of avoiding that. But um, just by way of, uh, well, but before we move on, let me ask you, like, so what is, what does your relationship to the, what we would normally, what I would call p p the pain or discomfort of drilling, what is it feeling like to you when you're in a kind of, uh, you know, I guess a kind of meditative state at, at the dentist. What's the difference between what's, what, what it feels like to you and what it feels like to me, do you think? That's a good question. I can mostly speak about what it feels like for me. Right. And then maybe you can relate that to what it's like for you. Yeah. Um, I was interested, I haven't had that many fillings, but I was interested when I was getting a filling put in a couple of years ago to see what it would be like just to be there with it um, as compared to be numb to it um, by getting Novocaine. And so I just, um, you know, I asked the dentist not to use the Novocaine and just sat there and, and noticed, you know, what it felt like, um, the smells, the, um, there's really a pretty, un I guess it's relatively unpleasant to have, um, you know, to feel this thing drilling through your teeth. You Yes, um, I've noticed that. I've noticed that, yes. <laughs> so, so it was interesting to watch my bodily reaction and how my body would kind of clench around that and uh, what types of thoughts would arise in terms of, if I can remember correctly, you know, like, oh, this guy's wearing away my tooth <laughs> with this yeah. drill. Um, and then also kind of even seeing this little anticipation of, oh, is this going to get worse? Is there going to be something unpleasant uh, that I, that, that quote unquote, I can't um, handle? And so just right. to watch all of that, I remember watching at times where my body got a little bit sweaty, um, which seemed like this, it was really interesting because there was like this, I don't know if it was a conditioned or just habitual or even a you know, reflexive um, bodily reaction to this thing happening in my body, kind of having this physiologic response um, that I would associate with, you know, some type of a, hey, this, is, this, is a, this isn't a great thing type of response. Um, so I, just really being mindful of it, it, I was really curious and just kind of watched it. And if every time the body started really getting clenched up, I just noticed that and um, just kind of paid attention to it. And it would kind of relax back into it. And then, um, okay, so, I mean, you're describing a lot of, uh, on the one hand, you're describing some some kind of unpleasant feelings, but you're describing them in a way that suggests that you were not identifying with them. So, so that in a, in a certain sense, they weren't unpleasant. But they were unpleasant. <laughs> um, if, if what you're getting at is, could they have been more unpleasant? I think this gets at this question of, you know, pain and suffering. Right. Uh, so, so the pain was certainly there if you want to, I mean, it wasn't super painful, but uh, the unpleasantness of, let's say, pain, for argument's sake, was there. Uh, the suffering was, you know, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, uh, and probably modulated by the degree to which I could really just be there with it as compared to, like you said, be identified with it, not caught up in it.
Mm hmm. So so being there with it is is different from being from identifying with it. I think so. Yeah. I think of identified with it being, you know, caught up in it where it's so much in my face that I can't see that it is it is this and mm -hmm. um, and you know the awareness is not there. It's just me being completely caught up in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're getting at a concept you kind of find in Buddhist uh, literature, I guess, a, a, a distinction between the kind of intrinsic pain or the intrinsically unpleasant part of something and the amount of unpleasantness that you add to it by your reaction to it. And, and that's the part that is that is said to be not necessary if you take the the appropriate, you know, uh, point of view, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think in some of the sutras it's described as dukkha and dukkha dukkha. <laughs> now, du dukkha me dukkha is often translated as suffering. Some people, you know, it's a, it, it, that's the standard translation. There are other, there are alternative or supplementary translations. But anyway, what was the second term you said after dukkha? Um, as in double dukkha or dukkha oh, dukkha. <laughs> right. Um, and that's the part that meditative practice, in theory, can spare you from. Yes. The double that, dukkha. That part seems to be option, optional. Right. Okay. And, you know, it's true when you are at the... Dem you know, I've... There have been times when, like, they... There was one time they had given me so much Novocaine, it was like... I was just like, no moss. I mean... We just have a problem here. I'm going to have to feel some pain. They were just having trouble. It was really deep. They're having trouble really neutralizing the pain. So I said, just just do it. And what I noticed is th probably most of the unpleasantness is the anticipation that they're going to strike a nerve at any point, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is it is the fear more than the uh, you know as much as the inherent pain. That was uh, yeah. That was my experience as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I want to talk a little more about your experience with meditation, but first, uh, I would like to switch uh, to your research on meditation, um, and in particular, uh, an important uh, paper that you were uh, that you were a, I guess, the lead author on in the uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences: Meditation Experiences Associated with Differences in Default Mode Network Activity and Connectivity. Now, this is part of a, um, I guess, what is now a body of research showing that this thing in the brain called the default mode network seems to get less active in the course of meditation, especially when you're dealing with very adept meditators, right? Yeah. So can you tell us, for starters, what the default mode network is, and what it, what it seems to do, what it's associated with? Sure, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a sketch of it. Uh, it's cons it consists of a number of different brain regions that are um, linked together functionally, so when they, they fire together, when one fires, another fires. And um, depending on how complex you want to get, there are two main hubs of this default mode network that are kind of in the midline of the brain. One is the medial prefrontal cortex, and one is the posterior cingulate, a little bit farther in the back. And these two hubs uh, kind of are seen as central hubs of this network that link a bunch of different brain regions together. Now, there are a lot of different studies that have been done on the default mode network to see what it does. And one, one of the, the most consistent and interesting findings is you know, how it got its name. So it's called the default mode network because this seems to be active when we're not doing anything in particular. And if you think about any average person walking down the street not doing anything in particular, there's actually a whole lot going on in their brain. They're thinking about themselves usually. So they might be regretting something they did in the past, worrying about something that's coming up, planning for something, um, fantasizing, you know, lots of things that are happening in our brains uh, when we're not doing anything in particular. And this network of brain regions seems to get activated or co-activated uh, when we're doing these types of self-referential processing tasks. So that's one one uh, cognitive task that the default one network has been associated with is self-reference, uh, when we're thinking about ourselves, when we're worrying about things. But it's also been associated with a number of other uh, cognitive states, including uh, rumination, worry, uh, craving, 
So when somebody craves cigarettes, um, the posterior cingulate gets activated. Um, it gets activated when we're justifying a choice that we've made. It gets activated when we're told to uh, make up a lie. Um, so it gets activated during a number of different types of cognitive states. Mm -hmm. But a and a lot of these cognitive states are explicitly or implicitly self-referential. They're they're about they're about you, what you'll do in the future, what you've done in the past, and so on. They seem um, to be yes. <clears throat> now. In a way, it seems ironic that some a part of the brain that's about the self would be deactivated in meditation because, you know, depending on what kind of meditation you're doing, you you may be doing something like what you were describing at the dentist's office, which is, you know, in a certain sense, focusing on yourself. That is to say, paying very close attention and almost being absorbed in the internal workings of your mind, you know, your feelings or or something, right? So, uh, but apparently, is it the case that when you're, in that sense, engrossed in yourself, that is just observing your feelings in the present and not thinking about yourself in the past or future, in that case, the default mode network seems not to be very active. Yes, so it seems kind of paradoxical, um, but I think if you, if you think of you know, thinking about the self as in the physical reality of Judd, um, mm -hmm. that's something that's here. And awareness can be aware of these physical states, the mental states. It can be aware of sights. It can be aware of sounds. But that's a little bit different than identifying with them. So identifying with I am seeing or I am hearing or I am hurting because my tooth is getting drilled. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. aware, yeah, awareness is a little less specific than I am aware. It just is awareness, you know, awareness of this. And the awareness seems less um, isolated to coming from someone, um, you know, identified as Jod. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, you know, you, I guess you would get the same finding if people were meditating on sound outside the body. Uh, and, and I guess you're saying that in, in that sense, whether you're meditating on, on something inside you or on something outside you, if you are, you know, kind of, I guess you're kind of meditating it on it as object rather than as subject or something. I mean, in, in a way there's no, there's no difference, right? I right. mean, right. you're, you're observing a feeling, you're observing a sound that, that in both cases you're, you're, you're doing it. You know, in a certain sense, from a distance. Although I know that's in a way misleading, um, and maybe you, would you find it misleading to say that you're looking at your feelings from a distance? Um, I it, that can be a helpful way to functionally describe it. Um, mm -hmm. You can think of you know if your feelings or your thoughts or your fist and your hand is you, and you're kind of completely sucked into that. Um, mm -hmm. That, as compared to just observing this fist, you know, from a slight, giving, having a little bit of space to observe it. Um, so in that sense, it, you could say that there's some distance. Uh, I think the misleading part is that awareness, when it's really at the object, there's no distance, you know, because awareness can't be separate from the object itself. Right, kind of. And, <laughs> and, well, I mean, to look, to get back to the question of sound, suppose you're meditating on sounds and you hear birds singing, you'd actually, in a certain sense, you're meditating on that, and you're, but you're kind of absorbed in it and feel very, in a certain sense, close to it, right? I mean, in a way closer to it than you might feel when you're not meditating on it and just hear it, right? Yeah, absolutely. So when not, you know, when totally mindful of, of the bird, the awareness uh, very experientially feels like it's, you know, there's really no separation between that bird sound and, and the awareness that's hearing it. Yeah. It now, doesn't feel like I'm hearing a bird at a distance. It just, there's just awareness of sound. Mm -hmm. And kind of absorption in it. Um, yeah, absolutely. In that moment. Um, and and that and that just doesn't leave kind of time for the default mode network. That's what your brain is doing. It's absorbed in the thing at, at the moment. 
in this finding of yours and some other researchers that, that the so-called default mode network um, switches off or, or it gets deactivated when, uh, particularly when very adept meditators uh, meditate. And you, you did assemble very, these were, these were people, I mean, you had your control group of novices, but you also had these very, very experienced, these people had done like thousands of hours of meditation, right? Yes. Okay. Um, t- let me let me jump to a a profound and difficult question. Um, you know, one of the one of the the doctrines of Buddhism that is is hard for people to wrap their mind around, especially if they're uh, they're kind of new to the idea, is is the so called no self doctrine. The idea that in some sense the self doesn't exist. Um, and you often find that serious meditators um, kind of have gotten a feeling during meditation of what that means and, and have indeed become more convinced that it's true during meditation, right? They appreciate this sense in which there is no self, right? Yes. Um, and is, and I assume you're, you're one of these people, um, is... Is that related to what we were just talking about, that your relationship, the way you're observing a feeling of yours on the inside of your body, um, is really very much the way you're relating to a sound on the outside of your body? Is that, is, is that part of why you're suspicious of this distinction between self and the rest of the universe, or, or Yes, not? yes, when there's strong mindfulness, that seems to be the case. Uh-huh. And, I mean, what else would you say, is there any way of, of, of elaborating on what it feels like to be meditating and, and, and kind of not think of the self existing in the way you would have thought of it existing before you ever started meditating? Like you said, hard to describe. I would start with um, that description of the bird that we talked about earlier where the awareness is is not separate from the bird and in that sense it's not separate from whatever the object of the meditation is or when just walking around you know not formally meditating when awareness is just at whatever object is present um that experientially uh, feels pretty different than you know me looking at an object or me feeling something or me concentrating uh, there's really that sense of there's no room for that sense of me uh, doing anything and when the me comes in or when I come in it kind of disrupts the whole picture the whole equation so there becomes a separation there's kind of a, a dissonance because their you know, awareness almost I would say is confused but that's probably not a good description for it um, but the it being at the object, you know, absorbed in the object, um, no longer happens when there is someone trying to do anything. And so I think of it from a very experiential standpoint. When I, when I as in itself, gets out of the way, um, the awareness just arises at the object, whatever the mm-hmm. object of meditation is. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so this might be a little like being just totally engrossed in an activity. The way some, some people might be familiar with this in sports, where for at least some period of time, you're just totally absorbed in the basketball game you're playing in or whatever, and you're not, you're reacting and, and perceiving but not thinking. Yes, and I actually gave a, a short TEDx talk a couple of months ago uh, and used that uh, description myself when I was mountain biking one time. I just you know, this whole sense of self dropped away and there was just, you know, just the trail, the bike, the mm-hmm. air. Um, and then, you know, when I finished the, the descent, you know, kind of myself came back online and said, wow, that was great. So it was very, it was effortless. Um, it was joyful. And there was, there was no one efforting. There was no one that was joyful. There was just joy. And there was just the trail and there was just the bike. And in that sense, it really didn't feel separate. None of that felt separate. 
you you were as much the trail as you were Judd. Yeah, and there was yeah, and there was no even um, no consciousness thinking about that. It was mm-hmm. just it was just what was happening. Mm-hmm. And have you been able to carry that much into your everyday life? I mean, first of all, you when I last spoke with you, I guess uh, some months ago, um, you were meditating. I think quite a bit every day by by the average person's standards. Mm-hmm. Um, are you, are you, do you still are you, you meditating kind of a whole lot, and is it kind of enough such that to some extent this mindset translates into your the rest of your life when you're not sitting and meditating? Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, so I started meditating in 1996, so a, a little while ago, and you know, pretty kind of pig-headed. So when I do something, I kind of really try to do it as much as I can. And at one point, you know, besides going on um, some longer retreats, I had, um, you know, been sitting, you know, two to three hours a day, um, you know, doing, you know, absorptive concentration practices or whatnot. Um, At one point, I, that kind of shifted, and I started practicing a lot of walking meditation and not in the not in the sense of feeling the physical sensation of the body moving, but more in terms of just allowing that awareness to be there. You know, some describe it as letting your senses rip. Mm -hmm. And so I would go out into a park and just, you know, be, I guess would be the way to put it. And so seeing green of the leaves and just allowing that to really rip and um, the texture of bark and, the feel of the wind and really just trying to get out of my own way. And in that sense, and I would do that for a couple of hours a day and that, um, kind of helped facilitate kind of seeing that, um, this type of awareness can arise, you know, without formally sitting on a cushion. And I, for a period of time lost, uh, my interest in doing formal sitting meditation I, because this walking meditation was, uh, very, it was easier to concentrate. It was easier to stay in the moment, and you know that kind of helped um, things shift a bit, such that it was easier to have this awareness arise. You know, similar to the, you know, I call it flow state that, uh, that when I was mountain biking, mm-hmm. uh, seeing that this is available all the time, and it's more a matter of of remembering that it's available and kind of just getting out of my own way, and then it pops in. And so I found myself more recently, um, you know, doing some sitting meditation, but really the, the real practice is every moment. And it, it, it's every moment that I can remember to be aware. I wonder if that's why the term sati, which is translated as mindfulness, is literally translated as remembering. So you just hmm. remember. And then the awareness kind of pops back out. And, you know, there's this clarity and vividness in the visual field. Um, there's, and there's, you know, kind of that separation of me looking or me being lost, uh, kind of, you know, the, the focus comes back in with the camera. And, um, and so that, that seems to be the practice now, it's just remembering, oh, oh, you know, and, and practicing ways to sustain that. Mm-hmm. So you've carried it more into your everyday life. Yes. Every moment that I can remember. And, and how has it changed kind of the way you are? I mean, uh, if, if people knew you, who knew you before 1996 ran into you now, would they, would they notice a difference in the way you relate to them or to other people, or, or would they notice anything? That's a good question. You, you'd probably have to ask them. Um, I think, uh, trying to think of what people might say, that maybe I'm a little... A little more relaxed, I don't know. Um, I certainly, for myself, find it easier to um, not kind of dogmatically hold on to a view. You know, if there, it seems more painful than to not. And so I haven't found myself that interested in debating things very much, um, even Buddhist mm-hmm. views, because, <laughs> you know, the experience 
it's really where it's at. Um, I think the concepts have been helpful, but you know, uh, kind of you know, debating somebody to the death, which I probably used to do much more. I, I've kind of lost the, the taste mm-hmm. for a bit. And um, yeah, no, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that just. It's much easier also to see when I'm starting to get caught up in something, whether it's anger or irritation or frustration, um, and just see it quickly and then have it just die off you know, mm-hmm. much more completely than previously with very you know, less residuum. Yeah, now that's interesting. There, There is, um, you know, one question people ask is, wait a second, if you get kind of too kind of indifferent, if you get too dispassionate, you know, uh, about life, doesn't that uh, kind of take everything out of it? Um, But I I guess in principle, you could be selective about which feelings you choose to engage with and which ones you don't, or which ones you choose to follow and which ones you don't. Is that your experience? Mm, I don't know if there's as much choosing as just being aware, um, it's, I don't feel less engaged with life. Um, Mm -hmm. I feel less engaged with suffering, um, because it, you know, it's it's like holding onto a hot coal. I realized, oh, I'm burning myself. And so I drop it much more quickly. Mm -hmm. But in that, so maybe in that sense, I hold on to these less and I pick them up less. But in, in terms of being engaged or less engaged with life, I feel like I'm more engaged because there's that smoke screen is gone. You know, the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the visual, you know, the clarity and the, is, seems higher and the separation seems less. Mm-hmm. Um, and you still feel like, you know, affection for people, affection for dogs or whatever you ever felt affection for. <laughs> Do you, um, and, and do you still feel, you know, kind of dislike for people or antipathy toward people or, or whatever? It's, it's harder to feel dislike for people. Um, so it, it's much easier to see that we're all in this together and that, you know, there's some, even if somebody seems like they're being a complete jerk, um, there's some, it seems maybe seems crazy, but there's some beauty in seeing that this was, this isn't their fault. This is their conditioning. And it was conditioned from eons ago, you know, that Mm -hmm. all these conditions led up to this moment, this person manifesting this behavior at at this time in this place. And it, it's not their fault. Um, in a sense, it doesn't mean that we can't change behavior, but what led up to that moment is a conglomeration of, of a whole host of factors. And so, being thinking that somebody is a jerk, it seems a bit more ridiculous. Right now, this is a concern you hear expressed about Buddhism. You know, if 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 immersion in the practice makes you less judgmental, as I think it tends to be, in somewhat the way you're descri- uh, describing, as it, as it tends to do, um, you know, d- doesn't that that won't society fall apart? I mean, you know, uh, traditionally bad. People who do bad things have been punished. People who do good things have been rewarded. And if nobody feels judgmental, will no one take the action to rein in, you know, evildoers? Well, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're not going to do the right thing. It might mean that you'll do the right thing more skillfully. And so whatever needs to happen, it's easier to see, you know, what might be the most skillful response in any situation as compared to acting out of you know, my own conditioning or my own habitual uh, reactions, which could be flavored and tinged with anger and judgment and resentment or whatever, you know. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if somebody's mugging somebody else, I'm not going to just sit there and go, oh, isn't that funny? Look at the conditions that, you know, that old Mm -hmm. woman is getting beaten with her own purse. Um, I might, I would probably do, what I could to be helpful in that situation. Um, Mm. And probably I would guess that I could be more skillful in doing what I needed to do because I could see more clearly. Mm -hmm. Now that you mentioned that you're not as into debate as you used to be. Is that because 
in a way you're no longer, you know, just as you now sometimes don't identify with your feelings in the sense that you used to, is it, you know, very parallel sense in which you don't um, identify with your own views and your own thoughts as much as you used to? I think so. You know, um, I don't know. You know. It's like I'm less attached to whatever the sports team was that I used to be attached to in terms of winning. You know, um, whether I, you know, there's some political view that I want to argue and show that I'm smart. I'm, it's just, I'm not that interested in doing in that. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of miss out on the richness of life by getting caught up in that stuff. And so mm -hmm. my brain just seems less interested in doing those things. It just seems painful. It's like, why would I, why would I debate this? This doesn't seem helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Especially if somebody else is really caught up in a view, um, why would I, you know, what help is it for me to, to debate it with them for hours and hours and hours? Well, one thing it tends not to do is change their mind. I've noticed that um, about yeah. debating with people. <laughs> I've, yes. I've, I've spent to so much time trying unsuccessfully to dispel confusion in this world, Judd. It just doesn't work. <laughs> um, the uh, Now, this, this so this business of kind of not identifying with a view or a thought in which you, in the sense kind of in which you wouldn't have, identify with a feeling in a meditative state leads to a question of mine, which is, you know, as you know, I've done some meditative practice, not nearly as much as you have. And I got to a point where I kind of know what you mean about the feelings, right? But when it comes to thoughts, it's like not so much. I mean, I, I, I've, I have with feelings, you know, depending on how you want to describe it, uh, gotten immersed in them or gotten detached from them, you know, depending on how you want to try to try to convey what's going on, but, but you know, in a certain sense, uh, acquired a more objective view of them, okay? With feelings, fine, I get that, I've done it. With thoughts, on the other hand, thoughts for me in, in meditative practice are just a problem, <laughs> you know, they just, they just interrupt the, you know, my mind starting to wander interrupts the, this, what I was describing with respect to the feelings, right? It's like, okay, good, getting, you know, you're getting, you're being with the feelings, this, this is kind of nice. Then the thoughts come in, and, and I have, and I don't, it, well, rarely, very rarely have I ever approached having this comparable relationship to the thoughts themselves. Am I making sense to you? I think so. And yeah. is that common that it's kind of easier to do this with the feelings than with the thoughts? I would guess so. I think I would I would want to ask a lot of people to see if that's you know their their experience. But I would mm -hmm. I would guess so, be, and I would guess so because you know uh, bodily sensations. It seems easier to kind of feel you know a, a pain in our finger. Is, and and kind of see that as oh that's my body that's a sensation in my body. Mm -hmm. There's a thought you know it's like it's somewhere in cyber it almost yeah where is, where is where is where is the thought exactly exactly the the pain in my fingers in my finger and even things like anxiety or melancholy are kind of in a place. Yeah. And I guess you could say the thought is in your head, but you're right. It's just not as connected to a part of your, it doesn't feel as connected to a part of your body. Right. So this thought arises and we assume, oh, this is me thinking. And so I think there's, I would guess, and I'm probably wrong here, but I would guess that there's, um, because that, there's not a clear sense door of, you know, thinking that we just identify that, oh, well, it must be me thinking as compared to just thinking arising mm -hmm. um, as a product of, you know, this brain, you know, doing its electrochemical reactions. Um, so we say, oh, that's me thinking. And we're much more, in that sense, we may be much more identified with our thoughts because we can't, it's harder to find them in that mental cyberspace and, and be able to clearly be with them with awareness because mm -hmm. when we're, you know, when we're lost in thoughts, we really just, you know, it feels like, oh, that's me. Um, there's a great saying, I think Jack Cornfield said, your thoughts are none of your business. Hmm. Um, and I think the aim there is, you know, they're, they're 
tricky little devils and they can lead to all sorts of stuff. And when you really start to see them clearly, you see that there are these immediate bodily triggers that they set off. You know, so we have a melancholic thought or a ruminative thought and there's this cascade that ends up in our body and we feel clenched and tight and, you know, um, agitated and restless. And, you know, the thought itself doesn't have a feeling tone to it. It's this, you know, it kind of connects somewhere and leads to this cascade in the body. And then mm. you know, that's where the trouble begins. Right. It doesn't have a feeling. But do you, do you find sometimes in observing all this that, in a way, feelings lead you to certain thoughts? Does that make sense? Yes, I think it's reciprocal. So feelings... And probably because they're conditioned. So you have a certain feeling, um, and this might be why people, you know, like, so let's say that you clench your shoulders whenever you're frightened. And so if you happen to clench your shoulders, you might be more likely to activate some thought of, you know, of danger or fright or something like that. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, you can have a thought, you know, like you're, if you're walking next to a cliff, you might think, oh, I might fall off this cliff. And it's just a thought. And you suddenly clench your shoulders because, it, you know, your body says, oh, you're supposed to clench when you have that type of uh, mm -hmm. fear response. And so the, I, I see the two as very reciprocal. Mm -hmm. and, and we we even see that in our clinical work with smokers, you know, where the thoughts aren't the things that drive people to smoke. It's the thought leading to the urge, you know, that craving. Right. Um, and maybe that's why this was part of the Four Noble Truths where the Buddha said, you know, he clearly defined craving. <laughs> as the issue right. you know craving craving is the cause of suffering and if you let go of craving you can end suffering that's right. you know he didn't list a list of 21 different things to to try to work with he listed mm -hmm. one thing and and to get back to this kind of reciprocal the way the feeling thought relationship works both ways isn't it the case i mean it's true that the thought that the thought of smoking a cigarette for a smoker who's trying to quit really yeah, it does trigger the reminder of how good it would immediately feel to smoke. But at the same time, isn't doesn't the thought arise because the thought itself feels good? In other words, there's something there's something affectively positive about the thought that kind of attracts you to it. Does it? There can be, but I would guess this is that associative memory. You know, uh -huh. so we have. Let's say that um, you start thinking about. Hawaii or, you know, kissing somebody. And mm -hmm. that leads to this, you know, you have this mental image of the beach or kissing somebody on the beach. Let's combine the two. One. And so you have this, um, this rising sensation in your chest of excitement, of romance, of, you know, of just pleasantness. Um, so I, I could see that, you know, it just kind of leading to this, the thought can be associated with a, a positive, mm -hmm. you know, a, a pleasant feeling tone. Okay. Now, you mentioned addiction. This is where you've actually done a lot of your work uh, applying meditative practice to the overcoming of chemical addictions, right? Yes. And, and, and how does that work? I mean, is it much as we've been suggesting that they, they meditate, you know, they in a sense learn how to acquire, well, in a way, a distance from the feeling or whatever, but, but they view the feeling differently you, you get them to view the craving differently is that the key yes so we use an acronym with smokers in particular we use this acronym rain where they have to recognize what craving feels like and they have to allow it to be there so often we push away unpleasant things and cravings unpleasant so we try to push it away and so we, we don't allow it to be in our body and if we can't allow it to be there we can't really investigate it we can't really uh, allow it to do its thing and you know come up do its dance and go away so the uh, a is for allow the i is for investigate and um, i think of this as really getting curious oh what does craving feel like in my body right now um, and it can even when you're really curious about something that actually flips the valence from unpleasant to pleasant because the craving which was unpleasant flips the curiosity which is pleasant and it can help us kind of stay with the object. Mm -hmm. And for the, for the end, we use a noting practice. So this is simple Mahasi style noting where people can note craving as it comes and goes. So tightness, tension, clenching, burning, rising, you know, as the craving comes and 
and goes away. So we use this, you know, other people have used this idea of um, urge surfing, you know, where you can, you can ride out your urges and mm -hmm. the RAIN acronym very much helps people get on top of that wave and ride it instead of getting sucked into the craving okay. and using. So whereas normally Pete, you would have the feeling that if you've got a craving, you've got to either succumb to it, surrender to it, or push it away. What you're saying is actually you can do neither. You can sit there and by observing it, in effect, weaken it. Yes, and you weaken it because you don't feed it. Um, so it's interesting in the in the language of the Buddhist time, the, uh, the dependent origination, where craving is this key link in this, you know, this feeling tone comes up, you crave something, you act on it, and by acting on it, you kind of reify a self-concept, which then spins back around and kind of changes the way you interact with future situations that mm -hmm. are similar. And, and they actually describe clinging. Um, what another um, translation of upadana, which is translated as clinging, is also uh, sustenance or fuel. Mm -hmm. So in, one, in an essence, you're fueling that fire every time you act on a craving. And so what we teach people to do is just be with the craving. Notice that it's physical sensations in their body um, and you know mental restlessness or whatever. And that if they don't act on it, they don't fuel it. And they mm -hmm. don't feed it. And when you don't feed it, eventually, you know, if it's a stray cat and you stop feeding the stray cat, it doesn't come to your house anymore. If you stop adding fuel to a fire, it eventually burns off. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to get back for just a second to this issue of uh, thoughts and kind of observing your thoughts. I mean, that that this is also related to the no-self doctrine, right? I mean, when you when you observe your thoughts, doesn't that in its own way, uh, kind of help make, you know, help make sense of this idea that, that the self doesn't exist or help convince you of it? Yes. So when, when we observe thoughts and just see them as thoughts arising, uh, it's very different than I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a thought that arises in awareness as compared mm -hmm. to, you know, check me out, dog. I just thought that thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one thing I've heard meditation teachers say at, at retreats is, you know, thoughts think themselves. Yeah. Uh, now, is there any, um, has the, have we gotten to the point where there's any kind of brain scan work that that relates to that? Uh, I don't know what, I don't know, I have no idea what, I'm, what it, that would even look like. But if people tried to kind of uh, corroborate this idea that, that thoughts aren't coming from a, from a central CEO uh, by using brain scan technology? I, I think it's a central question. I don't know if, mm -hmm. if uh, people have, it's a, it's a tough experiment to design. And there have been debates about, you know, the neural correlates of self for a long time. Um, the closest that we've gotten was to, um, you know, image uh, brain regions that are associated with self-referential processing in real time and um, have people, you know, kind of watch, uh, watch a graph of their brain activity while they're meditating. And some have described, um, so when you're meditating, this region of the brain gets quiet, like we talked about earlier, the posterior cingulate gets quiet. And they can be, you know, have, be meditating, watching this graph, it's, you know, it's, um, the PCC activity is pretty quiet, and then they watch thoughts come up, and it doesn't make the PCC fire, mm -hmm. uh, which typical self-referential processing does. And so, in this and in other instances, when they're kind of caught up in thinking, it, it, it does, you know, it gets more active. And so, this doesn't necessarily prove the absence of a self, but it can actually start to uh, tease apart the what these specific brain regions are doing and link it up. Uh, mm -hmm. link up this activity with subjective experience in a much uh, much more fine-grained way. Mm -hmm. And if, if the feedback is in real time, can this actually help people learn to meditate faster? We've, we, we haven't formally tested that, uh, and we've actually just gotten a government grant to, to do that specific test. So over the mm -hmm. next couple of years, we'll be, we'll be testing that hypothesis. We've seen it serendipitously in a couple of novice meditators who 
have been using, you know, in our studies and doing mm -hmm. the real time feedback and kind of seeing that one of them saw the difference between thinking about his breath and feeling his breath physically and his brain activity looked completely different. Mm -hmm. I, you know, in, in nine minutes, his brain looked completely different. So we're seeing this serendipitously um, and we'll be testing it formally, you know, over the next couple of years to see if we can give people feedback uh, while they're meditating, while they're learning, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction, to see if it helps them uh, learn it more efficiently. You know, I, I love this quote from Vince Lombardi. You know, he says, "Practice doesn't make perfect; perfect practice makes perfect." So, in this way, this type of feedback can give people, you know, be, be a mental mirror for them, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, so that they can see what it's really like to just have thoughts arise versus getting caught up in thought. Mm -hmm. So someday this will be a smartphone app. Yeah, we hope so. That would be really cool. Um, okay, let me let me uh, throw one more difficult to uh, explain or comprehend Buddhist concept at you and see if you, A, relate to it, and B, if so, can try to describe it or elaborate it on. You know, one thing you, you, you hear is, well, there's a lot of emphasis on in... Um, Buddhist teaching on delusion or illusion, um, and you know, sometimes what that uh, that means is, you know, it's it's a delusion to think that the gratification you seek is going to last, you know, or that that this attachment to it is going to make you happy, or it's a delusion to believe in the to believe in the self. But you also hear, and I, and I think this is especially related to the way you you. The, you're changing relationship to your feelings and emotions, maybe. But anyway, you also hear that um, some people say uh, that, you know, there's a sense when you're deeply into meditative practice in which the world itself seems more like an illusion than it did before. Seems, seems in a way less real. Does that make sense to you at all? I've certainly heard that, um, and maybe I... I guess, in a sense, I, I can I, I can um, relate to the idea of the self seems less real, mm -hmm. but in this moment, you know, there these objects in my computer, mm -hmm. you know, seems pretty real in that sense. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of permanent and and all of that, maybe that's you know, or at least a stable sense of self, but even you know, seeing these objects as things that are going to last forever, um, mm. that's easier to see in the impermanence of things. Um, mm. But, but I, in terms of the illusory nature of reality, that's something I'll have to keep meditating on, I guess. Yeah, so it, do, it doesn't seem like a movie to you. Um, the say that. Say that again. I said, so it doesn't seem like a movie to you. Reality doesn't seem doesn't suddenly just seem like a movie to you. Oh well, well in that sense, um, sometimes there you know it's like the mountain biking. Uh, you can be walking down the hall and it's there's just awareness of kind of seeing out of this what could be like a camera, you know, mm -hmm. where you know like you're in a similar way to watching a movie where mm -hmm. you see what the movie lens sees. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, that that part feels more yeah. like a movie. Um, you know, in the you know, there's less of a backfilling uh, of the things that my way, that my vision can't see. So the stuff mm. behind my head right now, my brain's less likely to kind of fill that in um, as compared to just leave it as nothingness. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. So maybe in that sense, I can relate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm kind of referring to, you know, there are, first of all, there are all these different schools of Buddhist thought. You know, there is no kind of one Buddhism, but one, uh, there is this doctrine of emptiness, which sometimes refers to the self, which is just a way of saying the self is empty, there is no self, but sometimes is also applied to kind of the world out there to say, well, that stuff is empty too. None of this stuff actually has essence, so to speak. And I guess that's the set of ideas I'm referring to, but I think meditators differ in the extent to which they kind of relate to that, to, to, to the part about, you know, the emptiness concept as it's applied to the outside world. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, 
All right, so uh, I guess that, you know, largely exhausts my list of questions. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you think it's worth talking about? Um, we're not going to touch on world peace or anything like that. Uh, you okay. know, I'm in favor of world peace. I just want to make that clear. Um, the uh, it, it is related. I mean, it, you know, as you know, uh, the, uh, well, uh, you tell me. If, if everyone, if everyone uh, meditative inten- meditated intensively, would there be any wars? I guess the, I would ask that as a question. You know, why would, why would someone want to harm themselves. Mm. Um, so in that sense, it doesn't, I don't think that there would be because it's kind of like, you know, why would you cut off your right hand? It's kind of useful. Mm-hmm. So I think if people really saw the non-separation, um, <laughs> how could they? Right. How could so, they have wars? Because the flip side of the no self doctrine, the other way of looking at it is that it's not that you're nothing, it's that you're everything. I mean, the, the idea is the boundary between you and the rest of the world breaks down, and that leads you to be skeptical of the notion of the self on the one hand. On the other hand, you're in a certain sense becoming everything, right? Yeah, you, you lose that separation, that dualistic mm-hmm. viewpoint. And by the way, what, what is your answer when people say, as they probably do, you know, when there's something in the news about a, a bunch of Buddhist monks, you know, misbehaving or... You know, Buddhists rampaging and killing Muslims in Burma or somewhere. Uh, do you get that question? Wait a second. I thought you said Buddhism uh, was conducive to world peace. <laughs> I don't get it that often. But if you're posing it as a question, mm-hmm. uh, I would say they're people. <laughs> that's, and that's the end of your answer? Well, people that have conditioning. You know, yeah. this is, you know, everybody's got their own conditioning, and, you know, if you want to call it karma or whatever, mm-hmm. but they're people. I mean, it, it's also true that actually, you know, Buddhists, even Buddhist monks, may or may not do much meditating. And in fact, in Asia, most lay Buddhists don't, don't do meditation, right? Um, so, mm-hmm. so they're kind of like, you know, Christians who hear this, who hear the sermons about brotherly love, as you kind of, as you typically would, I think, in Buddhism, but may or may not translate it into action. Yeah, again, people. You know, people are people. and um, It's until our faces are really, you know, shoved down into the, into the poop, you know, it's, it's really, you know, until we really smell how bad it is, we're, we're pretty reluctant to change. And a lot of us can kind of go on living in our, was one teacher described it as high-end samsara. <laughs> you know, it doesn't feel bad enough for us to want to change, and mm-hmm. we can kind of fool ourselves into thinking that it's okay, it's fine, you know, mm-hmm. we're not suffering enough that we're motivated to change. And you know, there's this, one of my favorite quotes from the suttas is, um, it wasn't until I explored gratification to its end that knowledge and vision arose. And, you know, our, our brains are pretty tricky. They train us to not explore that, to see what we're actually getting from our actions. Mm-hmm. And until we actually see what we're getting, there's not much motivation to change because things are good enough. Yeah. Um, so when you said, when you talked about, you know, if, you, if your face isn't really whatever you said, you know, forced down into the poop or whatever, are you <laughs> saying that if you haven't really inspected your interior enough to understand that there's a lot of stuff we should try to transcend? Uh, is that what you mean? Well, in, in the sense, yeah, in the sense that, um, you know, this high-end samsara is, we don't, we don't see these very subtle um, rumblings of restlessness and of uh, unsatisfactoriness that are, that we're carrying around with us and mm-hmm. doing the behaviors that we do that just perpetuate um, themselves and make this restlessness worse. And that, so that's what I'm talking about. Until we actually stop and look closely, it's really hard to see. You know, it's like, well, why am I not quite satisfied? 
you know, why am I coming down in the middle of the night and walking around the k- kitchen going, you know, I want something. I don't know what it is, but I want something. You know, that, that's, that's dukkha. That's unsatisfactoriness. And until we can see where that comes from or until we're motivated to look for it, um, you know, we keep doing it. And mm-hmm. so, you know, if, if somebody helps us or if we trip and we fall and we, you know, our face lands right in it, oh, wow, that's suffering. Or this is where meditation comes in. We, you know, we can meditate so that the, the baseline, so the noise goes away and we can start to see, oh, there's another level of suffering that I hadn't ever noticed before. I thought it was, you know, I, 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 yeah. Okay, but I gather you're saying that that leads you... I mean, to connect this to the issue of whether you would or would not go around attacking people and killing people, you know, the the problem we started with, um, you're saying that this degree of kind of inspection leads you to also kind of, well, both be much less judgmental of other people and thus tend not to condemn them and want to kill them, but also identify less with the views of your own that might otherwise lead toward hostility? Or is that, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know why you know certain wars are fought, but if in theory they're fought over some ideology, I'd be less likely to start one of those. Mm-hmm. You know, why should I force my opinions on others, mm-hmm. especially if it's going to cause them harm and, and me harm in the process? Okay. So kind of self-help leads toward a, a a more wholesome attitude toward others in the end. Yeah, yeah, especially when you see that there's not much of a separation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, listen, thank you. This has been great, Judd. Um, and I'll let thank you, you. Get, I'll let you get back to some walking meditation or whatever. <laughs> whatever. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.